A few months ago, a developer who worked on game engines reached out to me to discuss misconceptions going on regarding how consoles relate to PC. He had a lot of interesting things to say in general, but for me, the highlights really were talking about how the PS3 ushered in utilizing more than four cores, and then the Xbox One and PS4 ushered in making sure it can't just be clock speeds on a quad core, that with the low clock speeds of the seven seven cores in the PS4 and the eight cores in the Xbox One, developers actually had to correctly paralyze gaming workloads. And there were other interesting tidbits as well. He said that, well, the N64 definitely was more capable in terms of brute force. The PlayStation 1's disc player was a game changer. And well, a lot of developers thought they couldn't even utilize the space because of how slow you read discs compared to flash storage, it forced developers to find a way. It forced developers to come up with predictive loading, basically ushering in what we needed to make open world games. And that was the pattern of the conversation. Basically, consoles add a bunch of new stuff as a new baseline, and then developers find a way to use it to make the things they want to creatively. That a lot of the game engines we have now on PC can thank previous gen consoles for it happening. If it wouldn't have been for consoles forcing devs to use a new baseline and get creative with how to make what they want, they would have insisted on just using brute force to their own detriment eventually. And that goes for processors, which is the main subject of this video. The next generation consoles will indeed be more powerful in all ways. The graphical performance will be at least four times better, up to six times better. There will be more RAM for bigger worlds. But really, when you get down to it, the big difference is going to be the upgrade in storage and the upgrade in threads. The storage I've tucked on in length. You know, the PS4 and Xbox One basically targeted slower hard drives. We're talking 50 megabytes per second of bandwidth to send data and they're not going to SATA SSDs they're going to gen 4 SSDs and that is a literal 100x uplift at least in the case of the PS5 from what I'm told going from 50 megabytes in a standard hard drive to not 500 megabytes per second in SATA but 5 gigabytes per second in Gen 4, 100x, and they will leverage that. And they will leverage that for better loading, for entirely new dynamic rendering methods, but also to be able to supply their immensely powerful processors. You know, if you really break it down, I mean, the PS4 had a 1.6 gigahertz seven core, one core of the eight was disabled for yields. And then it had an ARM processor for background tasks. Now, the Xbox One base had eight cores, but one of them had to use half of its utilization for background tasks because they didn't have a background processor. In other words, it was kind of seven to eight-ish core equivalent, clocked super low. Now we're moving to 16 threads with double the IPC at double the speeds. We're talking at least an 8X, an 8X in CPU performance next gen this is done the writing is on the wall amd is flooding the market with 80 dollars 12 thread 1600s so that there is no excuse so that even if you were stuck with a quad core i7 it costs almost nothing to upgrade to something that can keep up with consoles but here's the funny thing intel was planning to catch up with this too intel saw the writing on the wall. They knew we weren't going to be using quad cores forever. We were starting to stall out all the way back to Haswell. You started to see Battlefield 4's multiplayer tax I-5s with some levels of stuttering. Intel knew what was coming. And they were working with devs to make paralyzation better as well. Except, as you would expect, Intel wasn't just going to give you 8 cores or 16 cores automatically. No, they wanted to do things on their own terms, forcing you to in mass at once upgrade to 6 cores when it was dirt cheap for them to make 6 cores, and only when it was dirt cheap.
This is the story of Intel's slow-moving coup to make quad-cores obsolete and how it massively backfired on them. The fact of the matter is that Intel was planning to move to 6 and 8 cores by around 2018. But they wanted to use 10 nanometer. You see, Intel had gotten drunk on the profits. They die shrunk Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge, and then they also went to Haswell, and then 14 nanometer Broadwell and Skylake. Look how much smaller these dies were getting. Smaller dies, once yields catch up, mean even bigger profits. And so they wanted to make you buy these tiny little quad cores for outrageous prices until they could make a six or eight core in the same package with decent yields. And that would require 10 nanometer. And they knew if they could get to Willow Cove by then with 30% higher IPC or even just Ice Lake with 18% higher IPC, that would be a death knell if Zen wasn't an absolute home run. Intel knew they would have to scale performance with more cores, but they wanted it to be six and a smaller die size than a quad core so they could make ever greater profits. And they knew if they delivered a massive IPC increase while moving to six cores around 2018 to 2020, no one would say anything. Really because nobody could if AMD wasn't competing. And the hubris really was legendary. All the way in 2016, it was starting to become clear that Zen would be better than expected. That Zen wasn't something you could just ignore while their 10 nanometer process was floundering. But even then, even when we knew Zen would really challenge them greater than anyone had expected in 2015, they were still planning to not release Coffee Lake, a 6-core 8700K, until late 2018. They were going to give Zen a whole year on the market. This shows you just how much they were still underestimating AMD. And they thought they could get away with it. And they thought, in the meantime, they'll just work with devs on programming for 12 threads. That's something Adored's actually covered, that Intel was working and is working right now with devs on scaling performance in a more parallel manner in games. However, Zen turned out very well, and one of the greatest things to backfire for Intel was their assumption that they could just keep the performance crown and that AMD wouldn't really go past 8 cores, 16 threads that quickly. And think about it. If you're programming games for a dual core, really you're pretty much programming for a single core and offloading some tasks to the second core, and then the second core is also used for background tasks. So devs didn't need to learn that much to program for dual cores. Then when you move to quad cores, again, they really just offloaded a few more of the tasks for the second and third and fourth core, but the first core was still heavily, heavily, heavily used. You can get away with that. But once you tell devs, hey, you can't get lazy, you're not just going to program for a few cores, you're going to program for 12 threads, that changes the paradigm. That means an engine built, right? If you build an engine for a quad core, you, you, you almost just built it for a dual core. You, you just offloaded a few more tasks and the first core is still going to be used way more. But if you build an engine for 12 threads, I mean... It should scale with more than 12 threads, right? If you're forced to paralyze the workload for more than a handful, it should paralyze for up to 32 threads or more. And that's what we've seen with the 3950X actually utilizing the majority of the threads already in some newer games. And that's something Intel just did not account for. All Intel can really do is offer lower and lower prices. And they have a lot of room to go, as I've talked about in other videos as well. And as I've been told recently by some sources, we already know Intel's preparing a 22 core to go above the 18 core. They don't like the idea of a 3950X, a mainstream, though expensive, 100 watt chip beating Intel's power guzzling HEDT flagship they want a better flagship so that's coming and if necessary i think they'll bring out even higher core counts i think we could get to a situation where by the end of next year intel has 28 cores for about a thousand dollars these things are not expensive to make but the problem is i don't know if that will even matter already you can see amd lowering prices across the board 
We have the 1612 nanometer edition settling in at around $80. I'm not sure how any Intel Pentium could compete with this. Basically, Intel will need to put their four core eight thread i3s below 100. And also we have the 2700X. Again, though eight cores, these are dirt cheap on 12 nanometer. AMD can spit these out. And I think the 3800 will be this new holdover segmented part. Let me explain. From what we can tell, Zen 3 will be an even more staggered launch than Zen 2. And I thought ahead of time Zen 2 would be incredibly staggered. All of these Zen architectures have pluses and minuses when you consider cost to manufacture. That's why they continue to spit out 1600s and 2700Xs because they're so cheap. So I think that's just how that's going to stay. I don't really expect an R3 Zen 2 chip anytime soon unless it's some kind of weird cut down Renoir. I, ju I just don't really see it happening. All of this is to say the overall lineup will probably be Zen Plus as a holdover for dirt cheap uh, APUs and laptops, and then also for $80, $1600, $120, $2700X. And then they will continue to make Zen 2 chiplets for Epic. So, well, they have over 95% yields. They'll probably just start selling the 3800X as the Zen 2 holdover, and then there will be a Zen 3 rollout above that. And I just don't know how Intel can compete with that. Especially when you consider there really is kind of a price floor in these Xeons and a limit to how many times they can rebrand them with higher clocks when the previous gen will flood eBay and limit their ability to sell the new models that really aren't that new. And look, yes, I am told that things are better inside Intel, that the better projects are being recognized again, that people are firing on all cylinders, and that at least internally, they've admitted they screwed up, that they're getting on track again, that 10 nanometer will be a real node in late 2020 through 2021 as they start transitioning into 7 nanometer. And it's good to see them publicly admit it too, to say that, Yes, we screwed up. These are all good signs. This tells me that Intel will have a resurgence to a certain degree within a few years. But the fact of the matter is that full 7 nanometer transition can't even possibly be completed based on the amount of EUV machines being manufactured every year until the end of 2023. So yeah, Intel can swing back in two to three years and it will probably be pretty great. But... A lot has changed in the past two years with how fast AMD has been innovating. And basically, for the most part, outside of a few key products, the next two years for Intel are basically going to be like this. Take as many punches as you want, AMD. I have nothing. And I shudder to think how many haymakers AMD may be able to land in that amount of time. Even if Golden Cove is incredibly impressive, will they really be able to produce it in good volume until 2023? And how good does it actually need to be? Doubling of IPC over Skylake? Maybe. I mean, AMD will be on Zen 4. And I shudder to see the Zen 4 versus 14 nanometer processor comparisons if Golden Cove is delayed at all. But it is what it is. Progress waits for no one. And Intel waited for progress. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's one of those scripts I've had for a couple weeks that I just didn't have time to get to until now. And... I have a lot more coming almost through all of my insider info I've been bombarded with for the past month. Be sure to subscribe to see the future videos, like it and share it, ring the bell button. And if you do like my content, whether it's this, Broken Silicon, or my other podcasts, please consider supporting me on Patreon. That really is what makes this all possible. All right. Thank you.